All right, everyone, one more panel. This is the headlining set, if you will, of the second annual Relics Music Conference. This, this is it. These guys are closing out our second day. Uh, be, and before we start, I just want to uh, congratulate Brad Tucker on putting on what a, a great conference. This, you know, this has really been his brainchild for many years, and he's done a great job of turning this into a, what I hope is now an annual event, and uh, I think we should give one more round of applause to Brad before we start here. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, speaking of great ideas, uh, I think it's a very um, fortuitous time to talk to you guys here because we're right after Jazz Fest, and I first heard about Superfly in the late 90s when you guys were promoting late night shows around Jazz Fest, um, and that developed obviously into not only a web of festivals and events, an agency business, and you know, you know, the events you guys have put together have really been a threat in my life for about 20 years now. And I was wondering if you guys could you know, start by um, introducing yourselves and kind of your current roles at Superfly, and then we could dig back a little bit over uh, you know, how this all came to be. Starting with you, John. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Uh, my name is Jonathan Mayers. I'm one of the co-founders of Superfly. Uh, my, uh, over, the things that I oversee are our programming, a lot of the creative elements. Uh, I work a lot on the development of uh, new projects and uh, been working with these guys for 20 plus years. Hey everybody, Rick Farman, uh, also one of the co-founders, and uh, my focus is a little more around the operational side of the business as well as uh, business development. And I'm Kerry Black. Um, I uh, work on a lot of the creative production um, and programming along with John, and also work on business development stuff. Yeah, our, our fourth partner, Rich Goodstone, is not here. He's got a family uh, emergency, but he oversees our agency end awesome. of our business, yeah. Awesome, awesome. Well, I, I see over here it says that you guys uh, formed Superfly in 1996, but if I'm correct, John, you actually used the Superfly name a little bit before then to promote some shows around New Orleans. So why don't you take us back to when you came up with the idea for Superfly and what you know, your initial goals were, and I think it was 1995 when you first put your first show on. Yeah, so um, I went to school in New Orleans. I, I grew up in New York, a suburb of New York, and was a fan of classic rock and um, the Dead and Bruce Springsteen, and then I went to New Orleans and I just got completely wowed by the music scene down there. Um, the brass bands and the meters and Kermit Ruffins, and it just really spoke to me. And uh, started going to the Jazz Fest every year and hanging out at places like Tipitina's and the Maple Leaf, and um, uh, I started investigating how to get involved. And uh, I got an internship at the Jazz Fest, and started promoting a couple of shows, and it, it really was about, um, I wanted one concert poster for my wall. That was basically, okay, that was the goal. Um, and uh, around graduation, uh, I put on a show at Tips. I was listening to the Curtis Mayfield record at the time, and I was like, oh, I'm just gonna call it Superfly Presents. And um, most of my friends went off and got, I guess, real jobs, or jobs that I was supposed to have, like a, you know, uh, law school or accountant, and I was just like, you know what, I'm gonna stay in New Orleans, um, I'm gonna start doing shows down here, and that's when I got a job at Tipitina's, and that's where I met these guys. Awesome, awesome. You know, one of the things that I've always loved about the four of you guys and, um, and the company you've built is that, much like a band, you really felt like a, you know, an ensemble. You each have your own individual personality, your individual interests, your individual musical taste, and you guys have came together to create Superfly. How did the four of you guys meet you know, as friends, and then how did that lead to a company which has now, as you said, been going on for 22 years? Well, to pick up the story from where John uh, left it, John started working at TIPS, and um, you know, one of the things that I personally noticed about the difference when he started to take it over is that he brought back the old concert posters, back to the concert poster thread there. You know, TIPS, if anybody's not been there, they have these really classic, you know, kind of, um, you know, matte kind of uh, concert posters that are hanging in the rafters there. And previously to John being there, that 
was had sort of been discontinued. And so you started to see a different type of booking and the old school stuff coming back. And at the time, um, we had a few mutual friends and I also was kind of interested in the business. I was, like many people, a, uh, you know, fledgling hack musician and realized pretty quickly, especially being in New Orleans, that there was no way I could make a career <laughs> witnessing all of that greatness. And so I, I started to get interested in the other side of it. And um, there was a band uh, playing at uh, Tips that I saw he booked, and I, there was a, a band that I was really super into at the time, which was Medeski Martin and Wood. Right. Uh, I think Carrie and I may have even gone together. Fish played the State Palace Theater <laughs> that fall, and you know, Fish, as many people here know, never has openers, but for a very small run, three shows, I believe it was two and all two in Texas, and this New Orleans show, they let Medeski Martin Wood open up for them. And it was like one of those moments where you just saw a band totally transcend in one moment. Like, they kind of blew fish off the stage. <laughs> and, you know, we were all like, kind of like, holy shit, this is amazing. So I saw John had booked them at Tips, and I just wanted to help them. I just had this like totally innate urge to be like, I, I want to help this band. So you know, totally having no clue what I was doing, I walked into John's office, and again, I think we had like a mutual friend who maybe introduced us and said, yeah, go over there and talk to him. And I was like, hey, you know, can you use some help promoting this show? And, you know, John, one of the things he was so smart about early on was like always getting everybody's perspective and always talking a lot to different people, you know, asking like from the janitor to like, you know, the, the head booker, like the head, the head of the bars, like who should I book? And so J John embraced me right away and he was like, yeah, sure. Kind of like knock yourself out. If you want to go promote this show, I'll take all the help I can get. No problem, kid. Like have at it. And... At that time, Carrie and I knew each other. Um, we were in dorms that were across the kind of street from each other at, uh, at Tulane. I think we met because Carrie was wearing a Otter Creek or Long Trail shirt or something. Otter Creek it was. Otter Creek shirt. And a, a, another mutual friend of ours was from Vermont, recognized that Carrie knew Vermont, and we all started to hang out. And... Um, you know, j just as a, a quick fun story, you know, at that point, uh, I, I sort of considered my musical knowledge and tastes a little more advanced than, you know, kind of the average college kid. I got exposed in high school to a lot of like, you know, jazz and world music, and I was listening to, let's say, slightly more heady stuff. And Carrie maybe had been exposed to a little bit at that point, but. Um, you know, for anybody that knows Kerry, knows he's like the most ferocious consumer of content in the universe. <laughs> and literally within like a week, Kerry had plowed through my entire music collection and was like turning me on to like super obscure stuff that I had no idea about. I mean, it was almost instant. So we kind of, yeah. you know, fell in love, so to speak, over that. And when I had, uh, you know, bringing it back to the story, when I had... Uh, you know, sort of told, you know, got this opportunity to help promote Modesky Martin Wood with John, I was looking for friends that would want to help, and I knew Carrie was into the band, and very importantly, Carrie had a car. <laughs> and, you know, that was a real premium being a college kid, to have a car, and if we were going to go around town hanging up posters, we needed somebody who could get us there. And yeah. so that was sort of the initial genesis of our partnership. Yeah. That Jeep Cherokee really did a lot for us. Right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> It's in the Superfly Hall of Fame somewhere, right? Yeah, yeah. no doubt. And uh, how did Rich get involved with all this? Was he, he was a friend of yours growing up? Or? Yeah, so yeah. Rich was one of, my, uh, one of my closest friends in high school. And uh, when we left Tipitina's, uh, me and Rick were like, hey, let's go do this on our own. And uh, uh, I needed some money, uh, which I didn't have any. Uh, Rich did. He was very creative. Uh, so he lent $5,000. I think he took like a loan off of his like parents' house or something. I don't know what he did. <laughs> but he got the money, yeah. and so he was involved. And then eventually, a couple of years later, Rich uh, moved down to New Orleans. Nice, nice. Everybody always thought Rich was like the money guy. Yeah. And, you know, uh, the, there, there's an a, a episode we always joke about. We were looking to... Uh, 
get into the venue business there, we're investigating it. Actually, you know, in an interesting twist, the, the venue is now an existing venue called the Civic Theater. We looked at that when it was, you know, an abandoned place that nobody had been in for 20, 30 years. And we were, uh, you know, walking around with the realtor and we kind of had to front somebody is who had the money. And so it was, you know, Rich Goodstone of New York was, yeah. the, was the guy with the money. But the truth is Rich's parents are were teachers yeah. and I yeah. mean, you know, they were on a pension. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah. you know, so he, he, you know, it was, you know, sometimes you gotta fake it till you make it, there you go. Now, you guys mentioned, uh, you know, obviously Fish and Medeski Martin and Wood, and if you look at the Jazz Fest landscape today, you know, especially the late nights are, are predominantly dominated by jam bands and improvisational bands, but back in the mid and, and late 90s, it wasn't the case. There was the classic New Orleans bands, as you guys said, some of those bands weren't as in vogue as they are now, and, and kind of the jam band scene hadn't, you know, reached the national um, praise it, it, it would a couple of years later. You know, when it came to kind of talking to local club promoters about bringing in what would become the jam band scene, was that a hard sell at that point, or was it something that you guys just took a leap of faith on? No, I think, I, you know, we were willing to take the shot, and we, we really believed in it, so I think, you know, um, that was what it took. We were, you know, we were so into that stuff, and, and, and we knew the power of it, and so, you know, I think it was just, it was about our passion, uh, that we brought to it, and you know, we were all for taking the risk at the time. I mean, a big factor to remember is that back then, the night shows at Jazz Fest were there wasn't any. It was just a couple club shows, and Jazz Fest themselves had a small series. But there was nobody using any of the theaters. There was nobody using alternative spaces like the Riverboat or any of the other venues that are now active. It was just a much different dynamic. And here you had like kind of, you know, four, you know, super green but ambitious New Yorkers. And we were just walking and talking a little bit faster than everybody. And I mean, like the early days, you know, people were so impressed by just like the baseline minimal things that you have to do to do business. Like people in New Orleans couldn't believe we would return phone calls and like show up and like yeah. pay bills. I, I mean, seriously, it was like a, a thing. And, you know, so, so it, it, in a way, in any other town, I think when you have hundreds of thousands of music fans in town, promoters would be in like a knife fight just to get the access to the rooms. In New Orleans at that time, it, it just didn't exist. And, you know, we, we started relatively small. I mean, we used a venue that was the, the Contemporary Arts Center, which was essentially a glorified parking lot with a half a roof on it. So it wasn't like we were rolling into, you know, established places. We were kind of making it up. And particularly with the clubs, you know, we would, we would start going to them and, and talking to them about, hey, we can bring this many people. Um, you know, one of my favorite stories with that uh, is, if anybody knows Hank Staples from the Maple Leaf and gets a chance to talk to him about this, he loves to make fun of me because, you know, I walked in to his bar and, and Hank's a hard guy to get in touch with. You know, even if he's in the bar, the bartender will usually tell you he's not there. And so it took a while to just like get face to face with the guy. And I, I was telling him, hey, there's this band that I saw recently and I know they'll bring like three or 400 people to your room. And it was String Cheese Incident. And he was like, String Cheese, what? Like, no way, I'm not doing that show in my room. And I was like, well, how about if we do it like starting at like 1 a.m.? And he's like, well, I don't have anything going on there. If you tell me you can bring <laughs> three or 400 people at 1 a.m., I mean, okay. And so that was a, a birth of a lot of that stuff was just kind of trying to find places that were being underutilized or opportunities that, um, you know, like nobody else would, would even dare think of in, in that environment. Well, you know, you know, I guess moving a couple of years down the line of, of the history of Superfly, um, when you guys you know, came up with the concept of Bonnaroo, and speaking of, you know, festival landscapes, as you mentioned, um, back in the day, you know, George Ween, who created many of the great American music festivals, including New Orleans Jazz Fest and Newport Folk, the, you know, the, the festival in America, at least, ended at 7 to 8 o'clock, and then people went and enjoyed a city. Um, and then in the late 90s, um, there started to be a, kind of a, a new wave of festivals coming in, um, mostly smaller and regional, which were more immersive, camping, all-night affairs, and you guys obviously, um, you know, created Bonnaroo and took that concept and emerged it with uh, what was going on in Europe. Um, what was your initial, um, I guess, thought of, or, or blueprint for that? Did you guys look at some of the European festivals? Do you look at other U.S. festivals? Yeah, the, the European festivals were definitely a, a huge influence on us. Um, I know I went from, I think it was like, 
96 to 98, I went every summer and just went to a bunch of festivals from North Sea to Glastonbury to all the, um, all these amazing festivals. And those were just had, gave us so much, you know, um, so many amazing ideas. And just to see the fervor that people had there for festivals, it was like so obvious that this should be replicated over there. And seeing the, also the, you know, the camping element, because that wasn't, you know, a, a huge thing for even the events that were in the U.S. at the time, having that huge camping element was, um, was different. So it definitely was very inspiring for us. Yeah, and, and I guess in terms of, you know, as you guys mentioned, you guys are from the Northeast. You know, you went to school and were living in New Orleans and had a, a dedicated following there. But Bonnaroo is held in Tennessee every summer. You know, was there was a, a specific idea to keep it in the Southeast? Was that just because you felt there was more space there? You could kind of go under the radar? You know, what brought you guys to Tennessee? Yeah, uh, I th think we were focused on the Southeast because of where we were, we were based out of. Um, and it's amazing when you don't know, and we kind of just started networking and talking, and we were talking to different vendors, and uh, the staging vendor said, hey, you should go look at this site. It's 60 miles south of Nashville. There was a, an event there, it was a failed event, but I think it's kind of what you're looking for. And we just drove up on the site, we made a, you know, a, a road trip of it. We hadn't done an outdoor show at that point. Our biggest show at that point was, I think it was like 3,000 people or so. And it just, it was amazing. Like we got onto the grounds and it just felt right. And we, again, it was just like intuition and, uh, and we kind of did the deal with the landowner kind of on the spot in a way. And then we didn't have the money, we didn't have the backing. Uh, and then we, we did the partnership with Corn, and we did the partnership with AC and then that's what happened. We, we did when we were like originally just trying to looking for sites. I remember thinking about the fact that we wanted to do something that was a big camping festival. So having it in that central area where everyone could drive to was definitely something that we thought about and wanted to be in that, you know, sweet spot. Yeah, I'd add a couple other things is that there was a couple things going on in the business that we were also paying attention to. One was that we were going to some of these smaller events that you were mentioning. I worked at High Sierra in, I think, 98. I think I went there as a fan in 97, and that was definitely like eye-opening. Hey, this can happen here. I think uh, you know we had been to uh, Burke Fest and a, a couple other smaller festivals. And then uh, an undoubtable huge influence was the fish festivals. Right. And this was also right as fish was taking their initial hiatus. And so it was kind of like, well, there's all these people who are used to going to a jam th event during the summer and they have nowhere to go. <laughs> yeah. So what if we get all of the big bands that are still around in that scene, including Trey, like, it just seemed a very logical thing to us that people would want to go to that. Now, we, we didn't have any idea of the success it would have, but as a baseline idea. And, and you know, to add to that, nothing was happening in the Southeast like that. You know, there were none of the other festivals. There was, so it was kind of felt like it was open to do it in the Southeast. And as Kerry said, you know, as we thought more and more about it, we, we did our research. It's like Tennessee's really like in the middle of the country. It, it, it's yeah. like a day's drive from 75% of the U.S. population. It just, some of those things started to really add up. No, uh, you know, before we talk a little bit about uh, how Bonnaroo um, kind of grew out of the, the fish experience, you mentioned that the event that took place in Manchester a couple years before Bonnaroo, I believe it was Ichiku, which uh, yeah. I, I think is about to have its 20th anniversary, or what would have been its 20th anniversary. How did you guys <laughs> actually find, uh, find that site? Was there someone specific who pointed it out, or was there a story behind that? Yeah, well, it was the staging company that I mentioned. I think it, I, I can't even remember that. It maybe it was a mountain staging. It was Ben Jumper. Is that who it was? His name, and it was also, it was also Bart Butler. Wow. Those oh, are the two okay. people who and, and Anyway, to. it was, it's, you know, we, we um, try and remember that as we're like going into new spaces about this idea of just talking to people and networking. And we, we probably looked at like 20 sites up until that point, and it just, you know, but it was a process. Now, you, know, you mentioned the, the fish festivals and a lot of people who have been core to Bonnaroo since the beginning kind of worked on fish events and were part of that ecosystem. You know, when you guys approached them about doing this festival, you know, what was that conversation like? Was there someone in specific that kind of was your liaison or did you know them through shows you had done in New Orleans like the Oysterhead Super Jam and, and events like that? Yeah, so that was sort of the nexus is that we had done the Oysterhead Super Jam with Trey and built a relationship with uh, both John Paluska and Richard Glasgow and John Langenstein through that. And so th those were some of the initial people we started to talk to, and they were incredibly gracious. I mean, I think they realized that 
um, they had a team of people that were really good at this, that wanted to continue to do it. And there was a lot of questions about what was gonna happen with the band and, and doing more things like that. And so they didn't really have any reason not to, um, you know, see if they can put some of those people to work, I think was kind of where it was coming from from them. And e even like, they were like, well, we have a whole bunch of stuff in storage that maybe we can, you know, you, you know, rent to you guys and things like that. So those were the initial conversations. Um, and it really evolved from there. There's a really key guy uh, by the name of Rob Napier, who was kind of the main operations guy for uh, the big fish festivals. And uh, Rob was exactly the kind of crazy freewheeling, like willing to, you know, get involved in, in something unusual guy that we needed at the time to help us navigate how to put it all together from a budget perspective, how to put it together, um, you know, from a, from a working with the community perspective. And, and through him, we brought on uh, Haddon Hipsley, who's a production manager who still works with us today. Um, Russ Bennett, who many of you guys know as being kind of the big part of the creative influence of fish festivals. And that was like the core, the core group of people um, at the very beginning that kind of helped us create the network and navigate it. And it was huge for us. I mean, it totally cut the learning curve off of so many aspects of what we needed to do to pull this off, uh, you know, with the experience we had, with the ages we were, all those kind of things. Yeah, a lot of those people are still with us too. Yeah. yeah. You know, one thing I think is being really interesting about this weekend or this midweek uh, conference in general is people's personal stories. And there's a lot of ideas of you know, being an entrepreneur, and you guys definitely are entrepreneurs. But one thing that I think is really interesting about your story is you guys were very young when you put on Bonnaroo. I mean, I think everyone was in their late 20s and, and early 30s. Did you mid, mid 20s. Mid, mid 20s, mid 20s, yeah. Not, not the age you guys right now. <laughs> late 20s, these guys. Did, did you guys ever find that there were people you approached who, at least initially, were like, well, you guys are way too young for us to want to work with you and then they maybe come back a couple years later and be like, we were wrong, we should have gone in here early. Um, I, there was definitely people that I think from a positive place were like, are you sure this seems like a really big jump? Like, you know, and, and I think that's also where we teamed up with Corn Capshaw and Ashley Caps. I think that that was really helpful. Obviously those guys were, were both really established, but we really, it was really well received because I think our intentions came across, like yeah. that it wasn't driven by money. I mean, uh, it was really driven by trying to do something really cool and uh, driven by our passion. And, um, and I think people sense that. And we had a, you know, four or five year track record before that, particularly the, our Jazz Fest event, you know, around 2000, 2001 was getting to be, you know, significant. We were doing, you know, 20, 30, 40,000 tickets over, you know, the course of the two weekends in, you know, 10 or 15 semi venues. So it wasn't like a total, you know, something to, you know, nothing to something. But, um, you know, jo John is right that like a lot of those partnerships we started to build and even how we brought on, you know, the fish people and later on, you know, a lot of people who were part of the whole Bill Graham legacy, it, it just helped us really, you know, shape um, a, a team of people that were reputable. Um, you know, one thing I, I think as just a business lesson that we really did well that back then is that we had a really good combination of um, like trusting our own intuition and gut and making sure that our vision for what we were trying to do was you know, sought through, but at the same time, and importantly, really listening to the people who were experts. And, you know, I think we showed them that respect for, hey, you guys have done this, you know how to do it, we're, we're not gonna be cheap on this or grind you on that or, you know, and, and then, you know, really them having the respect for us of here's how we want people to be treated and all that kind of stuff. That balance of experience and youth really kind of came together in a nice way. Yeah, an another person that was really um, critical and just influential was Chip Hooper, um, who was, a mentor to us, um, starting with Modesky Martin and Wood, but uh, Oysterhead, and he made that introduction to Corn, and just someone that really, um, I think, taught us a lesson about just, you know, being open and supportive and giving, and so, um, you know, we, we think about him a lot. Yeah. You mentioned earlier that, you know, when you first wanted to put on the show, you wanted that poster to hang there, and I think that that's a really key image because 
all your guys of events over the years, whether it's Bonnaroo or you know, events you're doing in, in Arizona, Colorado, California, they feel like they have a sense of place. When I'm at Bonnaroo, I feel like I'm at Bonnaroo, not in Manchester, Tennessee, or when I'm at Outside Lands, I feel like I'm at Outside Lands, not in San Francisco. And you guys draw from those local environments, but you create kind of a through line throughout the entire event. Was that something you guys were conscious of when you had your first shows in, at, you know, in New Orleans, or is that something that kind of came naturally because you guys were, in a sense, throwing a party for your friends and, and bands you love? I think so. I think, you know, that was what we were passionate about. Our, our first shows, were, the first event we did was Take Funk to Heaven, Mardi Gras 97. And uh, we were just excited to bring a bunch of bands together. We didn't just want to do one band in a club. And so we put together, uh, if you believe that was Funky Meters, uh, Galactic, uh, Maceo Parker, Rebirth Brass Band, uh, George Porter Jr. So, um, you know, it was about putting together like a cool bill and doing something creative. And that's always been sort of our ethos is to... Um, you know, not just put a band on and, and, and you know, take the check. It's really about creating something special and, and an event that we're excited about and then hopefully other people are excited too. Yeah, and we were, we were really inspired by um, Bill Graham, mm -hmm. you know, the legend of Bill Graham and really thinking about this as a creative outlet, right? So it wasn't just about just what happened that night. It was the poster, it was the attention to detail and the whole experience. And I think even those early days from when we worked at the Contemporary Arts Center, the parking lot Rick was talking about, we kind of festivalized it. You know, we, we, we thought about the decorations and what the ticket looked like. And honestly, that's the fun of it. And I think as we, we've been doing this a while, we sometimes, you know, you, you have those moments that you forget but th those are the stuff, that, that's like the baseline stuff we try and get back to. Yeah, you forget the operational details, like you need more than one walkie-talkie to, right. to do any good, which we did not do the first event. Yeah. <laughs> to, to fill in one small aspect of this, or one meaningful aspect of the story, we also were doing this in New Orleans, you know, in the shadow of one of the greatest festivals in the world that is such a sense of place, right, in the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival. So in a way, the bar for us of what a festival experience was set really high. You know, for, for anybody who's been there, you know that like you walk in that place and you feel like you're just enveloped in New Orleans and the culture and the, the small experiences and the food and all the different sort of ways that it created tradition. And so I think that's something that like we have carried through and, and you know, it, it was, one of the, again, people who showed a ton of generosity to us early on was that whole Jazz Fest organization from Quint on down, even George. Like, you know, they, they could have actually really been almost threatened or stomped on us. You know, a lot of promoters are like that, seeing somebody do something kind of on their, on their backs in a lot of way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to, to, for them to be supportive and to be open to us, you know, kind of doing what we were doing in that regard was a, a huge thing for the tone of how we wanted to treat people and, and things like that going forward. Now, you know, obviously since Bonnaroo and, and the Jazz Fest shows, you guys have done, uh, you know, huge events where you've really built cities and in, in functioning cities across the country. You know, what are some of the challenges of working with a city to put on an event like Outside Lands or what you do with Lost Lake in Arizona and now going into Colorado and stuff you've done in New York? I mean, which is, a, I'm sure, a very different experience than kind of building from the ground up this kind of inclusive ecosystem in a remote place like Manchester. I think the same principles that we actually use there and that were shown to us by that core fish crew that we were talking about um, really apply to our approach, which is you've got to be truthful and honest and, and build trust. You know, the, the fun story with, uh, you know, Bonnaroo is that when we sat and met with, you know, the, the city mayor and the, you know, sort of different powers that be really early on, you know, the people that we were with, Haddon, you know, John Langenstein, Richard, they, they were basically telling the people there, hey, there's going to be nudity there, there's going to be some drug use right. there, there's going to be a ton of traffic. Yeah. And they just didn't bullshit anything. They were like really straightforward about what was going to happen. And of course, selling the benefits of it and how we were going to help manage it in a, in a way and using their experience with other events to show that they could do that. And it's, it, at the end of the day, it's all your reputation, right? It's like, are you gonna do what you say you're gonna do? And then when people come check up on that, 
are they gonna get a good reference? And so we take the same approach when we go to any municipality now and say, hey, we wanna work with you. It's here's what we're looking to do, here's what's gonna happen, here's our history, here's how we mitigate the, the negative effects, here's how we promote the positive effects, and it, it, it's pretty much just, just be that way, you know? And being a good neighbor, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we do a lot of community outreach and being on the ground and, you know, again, like communicating our intentions and uh, that we care and we, we know that we may be a disruption, but how can we, you know, make it the best experience possible? I mean, we, it was a two-year-plus process on Denver and a lot of that. But that's also fun, you know, like... Yeah. Well, you mentioned, you know, your Denver event, which is coming in this September, and actually a couple of panels this week have talked about, you know, Denver being one of the live music capitals, yet outside the bluegrass and roots world, it doesn't really have a long-term rock festival. I mean, what guys brought you guys to Denver, and, you know, what can we expect for this event coming in a couple, couple months now? Uh, well, Denver f feels like it fits the profile of a place that we should be doing an event, uh, besides cannabis. Uh, you know, the, the, um, it's a great music town. Um, we have a great local partner with our, you know, uh, uh, um, AG and Don and Brent and, um, and yeah, they, it felt like that there was a white space. I mean, obviously it's got one of the, you know, most amazing venues in the world with Red Rocks, but, you know, there's kind of this space in between and, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, fastly growing city that's changing and hopefully what we can bring there is obviously very influenced locally but maybe we can bring some outside elements and kind of help be part of where it's going so um it's been going really well we're really excited and uh you know it's taking shape yeah, it's, uh, it's exciting. We've been wanting to do a, an event there for, for many, many years, and, and now comes the fun part where we get to actually go spend a ton of time there and get to know the city, get to know what people are into, and right now we're you know, creating all the different you know, areas there, um, different culinary activations and all that kind of stuff, so this is the fun part. It, it, it feels in many ways like it has the ingredients for why we're successful with outside lands and have continued yeah. to be. There's just a culture there and a lifestyle and um, you know a, a little bit of a business white space in terms of venues and how acts can line up there that um, you know is the right recipe to do as these guys were saying to do what we do great. You know it, it, we can't do it everywhere. Um, but there are certain cities and elements that lend to the kind of creative thing that we're trying to express through festivals and, and the community thing we're trying to express through festivals. And so, um, you know, it, it's, it's pretty fun as a, just a music fan. Like, I think if all of us looked back and said, you know, you'd be doing events in places like San Francisco and Denver, uh, and, and beyond, like, as music fans 20 years ago, we would be pinching ourselves. So. Yeah, I think one of the one of the big things going back to like all the par our partners and stuff is collaboration is so big there. Like that's what we hear when, every, when we met with everyone there. Oh, we just want to collaborate. We want to do this. And there, everyone there is so into working with each other. There's no like trying to get on, you know, over someone. And that sense of um, you know just collaboration and working together is really where we come from, and really I think matches us. Um, it's a good match for us. Now, you, you mentioned you guys are working with AAG in this event. You guys obviously work with Live Nation and Bonnaroo, and you have uh, you know, another planet as a partner in, uh, in San Francisco. How, you know, how, have you, how important has having partners been for these large-scale events for you as a company? Has it been essential? Is it something that's just you know, p different people have the same idea at the same time, and it's you know, better to combine forces? You know, how do you rationalize that as a company? Well, I think you start a little bit with the DNA of our business, right? We're a little bit unique in that we have four of us that are founders and still 20 years later operating together and, you know, getting along and figuring it out how to, you know, evolve and mature and change and, and still, you know, be, be psyched about doing it together. And that, that's hard. It takes a lot of hard work. But what's at the core of it is we kind of each know that we're better when we work together. Right? And I, I think it's no different with outside partners. Um, you know, how can you work with somebody who brings something to the table that you can't, whether it's they're vested locally in a way that you're not, whether it's something like what we're doing with Comedy Central and Viacom on Clusterfest, where we're trying to go into a totally different genre and apply a lot of the talents that we have 
have and work with a, a, a company that has as much of a you know media presence in that particular you know space as as they do, and so it, it really just boils down to you know it's our DNA is working with other people. We we love the challenge of it. We we have learned a lot of I think life skills and how to partner with people and how to respect other people's perspectives and opinions and still be able to have our own imprint and you know each each relationship you 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 treat in a particular way and you manage in a particular way it's also why we've become you know i think really successful on the service side of the business of what we do with helping brands navigate the marketing space is you know we're, we have a, an empathy for what they're looking to do and how the individual person working on a particular brand needs to deliver a product to uh, you know and deliver a, a marketing plan or strategy so it, it's it's really kind of if you boil down what we really do well, it is work with other people and, and create partnerships and opportunities around that. You know, you, you'll, you're speaking of the agency, which um, a lot of people here probably don't even know all the stuff you guys do there. You know, early on, uh, you know, Bonnaroo is known for not naming stages after corporate sponsors, and that felt very organic and very in line with the experience you guys were presenting. And obviously, the agency <laughs> side of Superfly has you know, been partners of events in multiple continents across the world. You know, how did the agency first evolve out of kind of what you were doing at the events and the festivals and where is it today? Yeah, it, it was born out of doing sponsorship and content deals at our festival properties. And, you know, to the point you made about not putting signage on stages, we, we wanted to do it in a cool way, right? Yeah. We, these, these festivals are really expensive, and so having the revenue from sponsorships is important, but we didn't want to be cheesy about it, and we wanted it to hopefully add value to the experience, and we wanted to own those relationships. So Rich uh, built a team to sell against those properties and uh, you know, service the clients and activate uh, whatever we were doing on the grounds, and I think brands started saying, hey, can you come do that for us? And that's kind of where it was born out of. We were also, you know, fortunate that first year because we sold out so quickly that we weren't, you know, we didn't have to, to do things, uh, you know, to use sponsorship to, you know, make, make the bottom line work. Um, so that really allowed us to create that, uh, that, that space. Well, you know, and as you guys mentioned, you guys bought a that first year and, you know, really created a new benchmark along with, you know, Coachella for what is now you know, the U.S. festival market. Now that there's festivals in so many different parts of the country, you guys have, I think, five festivals this year in, in many different markets. You know, where do you see the festival scape today as, as a company who not only puts these events on, but is working with sponsors who have, you know, ties to different events, and you've worked with bands who have played all these events over the years? Yeah, we're making a conscious effort um, to be, we're in the live entertainment business, and that's really like how we're kind of thinking about where we're at. Music will always be in our DNA, and uh, music festivals will always be in our portfolio of events we do. Cluster Fest, I think, is our first example of really kind of taking a swing in a kind of a, a passion of ours, another kind of vertical, but that we think that we could have a different approach to it. And um, it's been really fun to kind of have that kind of, um, that feeling like we had 15 or 17 years ago with Bonnaroo that we weren't really sure, but we know we're kind of moving in the right direction towards things like we're excited about. And so I think you'll see more of that from us is interest of ours. It will probably always start with our passions and uh, experiment, try things. Hopefully more will work than not. No, definitely. You know, I, you know, as someone who kind of grew up attending your guys' events, I look at the first Bonnaroo, and I was really excited for that late night Mo Super Jam. And you know, at Outside Lands last year, I was really excited for the pokey I had. You know, there's something very nice about having a very authentic kind of curated experience at different points in your age. Do you guys? Are there other areas? Do you think you could expand into? You mentioned obviously food, and obviously you've done stuff with, um, you know, liquor and different craft beers and stuff that you haven't had a chance to kind of break into yet. Pl plenty of space, right? I, I, I think that one of the things for everybody who's here that's in, like John's saying, yeah, you're in concerts or music, but we're all in live entertainment. And for people who do live, there's a lot of potential to apply that skill set to lots of other areas of, uh, you know, entertainment and beyond music. And you know, it's it's a time in our world where people are looking for real world, meaningful experiences. You know, it's um, because of and in 
spite of um, what's happened with our digital lives. And so, you know, whether it's working for a client or coming up with a concept, you know, the opportunity to create meaningful, deep experiences that start just like what John was saying with like passion. You, you think about almost anything that you are passionate about, there is a way to create a meaningful live experience or a meaningful live activation through that um, that's pretty broad. And so we're very lucky that we kind of have this platform of the things that we've already built and the reputation to start applying that you know, to, to all the different passions we have. Well, you, we've talked a lot about kind of the uh, experience you guys have had as hosts of bands and events and, and brands, but at the same time, you guys have also grown a lot of bands by having them at your festivals, having them at your events, obviously over the years managing some of these bands. You know, when you guys close your eyes, who are the bands that first come to you that you feel like have really grown with Superfly over the last 22 years? Um, I mean, the first ones that come to my mind would be My Morning Jacket um, and Portugal the Man are both ones that with, you know, came up along with Bonnaroo. Um, so it was really special to watch those you know, bands that we really love to and um, you know, saw them to, to, grow, to blow up was really exciting. Do you guys have other examples of those? Well, or, yeah. You know, what Carrie's referencing, I think your question is, there have been a, a, a string of bands that always sort of feel like they're like super fly bands, right? Like, no matter what the tastes are in the office, like everybody, for the most part, you know, is like, oh, I'm, I'm into that band, right? And it started with Medeski Martin and Wood. I mean, that was kind of our original flagship. And, you know. Give applause for Medeski Martin and Wood it, here. It's killing it. It, 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 it. You know, and like Carrie was saying, I mean, it, it went kind of from there to My Morning Jacket, and Portugal's another one. I, I think another one that, like, I'm, I'm starting to see right now is that band, and I'm, like everybody butchers the name, so I'll do it too, is the band Krungelman. Right. You know, it's like, I actually went and saw them two nights in a row last week. I haven't done that for a band in like a, a long time. And, and you know, it, it is a kind of cool thing about our business is there are these moments where kind of everybody starts to kind of circle around something that we all really, you know, it, it, like, and there are the bands also that sort of have those transcendent moments, right, for us. You know, there's kind of probably a, a, a slate of examples where we can think about, oh, it was like the, you know, the, the Radiohead show in Bonnaroo at, you know, 2006 that kind of changed, you know, the perception of who we are and what that thing was. Jay-Z, you know, at Bonnaroo, whatever, you know, other examples like that that have really kind of marked our history. Let the record show, Krungbin's first Manhattan show was in the Relics office, so. Yeah. yeah every, get a round of applause for that. <laughs> You, know, you mentioned, obviously, you know, the Radiohead show and the Jay-Z show, which were both seminal moments for you guys and for the festival. And I think one of the, the best things about that, just like the best thing about having a My Morning Jack or a Portugal Man or Krongman play your guys' events, is that you're almost dropping them into this, this framework and seeing how they react. You know, you know Radiohead had a, a longer set. People were throwing glow sticks at them, so they kind of reacted a certain way. And obviously, <laughs> Jay-Z playing after Stevie Wonder, you know, he had a lot going on in his mind and stuff like that. You know, do you find that when you guys are booking events and putting events together, there's almost that contrast that... Going back to those first shows you did at Jazz Fest when you had Galactic playing with some of these legends, it kind of elevates people on both sides? When we're booking and we're looking at the grid, we're really thinking about that flow and we're kind of like thinking about what it would be like uh, standing there and in, uh, anticipating the next artist. So it's definitely uh, something we pay a lot of attention to. I think it also flows from the jam ethos, yeah. right? Like for what everybody here, I assume you're here because of Relic sort of has a base passion for. It was what was so cool initially about the opportunity when we started programming stuff in New Orleans for that audience and transferred that into Bonnaroo and, and even you know the festivals that we do now is that um, you know the, the true music fans really you know, not only have a passion for the things that are kind of in front of their mind at the, of the moment, but also the history and the connective tissue to how those things got there. And, you know, we're, we also now see that in all these other disciplines, right? Like comedy is super interesting for us in that regard because a lot of the artists that we are programming now at a high level started with us in the Bonnaroo Comedy Tent as you know smaller acts and then we were able to bring in you know legends around them Stephen Wright you know now David Cross like whoever it may be to sort of also create that same energy and that same mix of, of you know classic iconic and of, of the moment and 
play all those two things together. And I, I really do think it's like a lot of times the, the jam scene has always gotten sort of a little bit targeted with being closed minded and you know, we all could all joke around that and you know, going to see 10 fish shows in a row and all that and like go do something else with your life. But you know, at the end of the day, it, 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 there's a real contrast there with, I, I think from the bands to the fans, like everybody really respects the history and the, the, all of the different things that make up why those bands are great and want to be a part of that. And you know, that, that's, that's, that same thread is exactly how we think about things today. Awesome, I think we have uh, some time for some questions here. How you guys doing? Andrew Berbaum. Uh I was curious about you guys. You guys almost seem like brothers up there. And uh, I've been an entrepreneur my whole life. How, when, from that moment you guys were in the car, you know, driving around, sharing posters and trying to promote your first show to where you are now, how did you guys figure out like, what you were good at, what you were bad at? And like, how do you divide and conquer to your, your responsibility today? Still figuring it out. Yeah. yeah. Just, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think that was we were just so passionate about it. We just got in there, and it wasn't like a, you know, we sat down like you're going to do this, you're going to do this. Uh, but we just sort of um, kind of fell into these um, uh, spots of like, because things had to be done. So it was like, okay, someone needs to do the marketing. So I, I just took that and sort of, uh, you know, watched our friend who did our first couple of ads and, you know, taught myself Photoshop and Illustrator so I could do that. And, you know, Rick sort of started running the operations. And, you know, we just sort of, um, you know, chose things because we had to, because we had no idea what we were doing. Uh, and, you know, and from there just sort of evolved them as we went. And, um, you know, we just, um, have kind of let ourselves grow along the way, so. And that, that um, issue is, that's an ongoing thing, right? Is like giving each other enough space and latitude, uh, even though we, we disagree a lot. Uh, but I think over the years, we really have built an amazing sense of trust. Uh, but again, this is like every day we're kind of growing and learning and evolving and so. And being very deliberate about it in that regard, like we, we actually have re recently been working with an executive coach who really kind of helped us figure out how to refine a lot of the processes that of where we're at right now, of how we do work together and how we do make decisions. It, it is truly like a, a life relationship and as you mature and grow and become more aware and calmer and, you know, like other things get involved, right? You know, we have families, we have mortgages, we have a, a lot of people that work for us now. And so, you know, we're, we're always, I think one of the things that we have always kind of held true to is it's all a learning experience. It always was our mantra. Every time we would fail on something or be down about something, we always went back to, hey, th this is an opportunity to learn. And I think we, we look at the partnership in the same exact way, which is each time we're coming to a stumbling block, how, how can we use that to be better people, essentially? Hey guys, it's a great panel, thank you. My question for you, is there any specific moments that happened either at Bonnaroo or Vegas that was purely a magical superfly moment? Not necessarily like Jay-Z being there or Radiohead, but is there anything that stands out where you're like, this could only happen you know, at a superfly event? Uh, I definitely have one. Um, <laughs> um, we did, um, for the 10th anniversary, we did a super jam um, that was uh, Dr. John and the Meters with Alan Toussaint recreating Decibly Bonnaroo, which is an album that Bonnaroo is named after. Um, and that was amazing, but that was not the part I'm talking about. Um, we, from there, we had the Preservation Hall Jazz Band do a second line parade from the backstage area. They paraded out through all of Santeru. Uh, which ended at a Mr. T float at four in the morning and Portugal the Man played a surprise set from the Mr. T float, which I'm pretty sure won't happen anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, we did. We had food. <laughs> Where's that Mr. T float? Is that still around? Is that like oh, yeah. in the, in the graveyard there. there somewhere? Okay. <laughs> I think over here, Alec. Mm -hmm. 
Hi guys, um, my name is Tara Nolan. Um, I've worked in media and advertising my whole career on the agency side, so biz dev, marketing, all that stuff. So I find that your interest in expanding your services and agency offer is very interesting. Um, but I'm just wondering how you've felt the spaces uh, in terms of navigating that and offering clients or competing with other agency people that have been doing this forever, um, how that has been challenging or opportunistic for you? Uh, yeah, every, it is challenging. I think we're at our best when we um, highlight what differentiates us. And I think that, that we're coming from this place that we've created these um, fan events and you know, consumer events and we understand, hopefully we understand the audience. And I think that's what gives us kind of a different story. And so we really kind of focus on that. Any other questions? Anyone in the back? All right, well thank you guys, that was great, yeah. Thank you. Right, thank, yeah. you. thank you. Thank you. No, wait, sorry, we have one more question. The encore question, okay. Oh, hey, uh, Andrew O'Brien, thanks, great presentation. Um, you guys spoke a little bit or a lot about how, you know, getting your start with Mendesky, Martin, and Wood and seeing them play with Fish and how that was a big thing. And obviously the first Bonnery was very jam-centric and the first few were. And then as has, I'm sure, been noted to you many times, it's sort of shifted more towards mainstream acts. And I was wondering if there was a point where that was a conscious decision to do that, if it was just the natural progression of things, um, you know, if you're happy with you know, how the different shape is taken of the event as the years have gone? Uh, yeah, you know, we got into this because we're music fans and we love all sorts of music. And I think at the time we were very influenced by the jam scene and we're still fans of a lot of those bands, but it's always been different genres and hopefully uh, discovering new. And I think that's the cool thing about a festival environment, but um, I, I think with all these things, you kind of have to breathe new life into them on an ongoing basis, because what was sold 70, 80,000 tickets in 2002 is, is different today, but I think it's kind of the, the spirit and the vibe is what we really try and hold on to. Uh, but yeah, I, I think we're happy with how it's evolved. Uh, I would just say that, you know, for better or for worse, change and pushing forward and trying to break new bounds is part of who we are. We just don't sit still very well. And, um, you know, I think as, as we were, you know, trying to evolve not only Bonnaroo, but just our overall business, it was really about, hey, how can we continue to be on the cutting edge and innovative and of the moment? And um, it's, it's what's exciting about some of our new projects, whether it's a new community or a new genre like comedy, you know, to, to just be feeling like we're, we're going forward and we're, we're moving um, into cultural spaces that are, you know, interesting and happening at that particular time, that, that's a big thing that drives us. So when we look back on that history, it wasn't even like a, a decision to make. It was, this is who we are. We gotta keep moving forward and challenging ourselves, challenging our audiences and creating new things. And I think one of the great things about the jam band scene is that it's always adding people into that world. If you think about it, Modesky, Martin, and Wood weren't really part of the jam band scene until that run opening for Fish that you guys mentioned. They were part of this downtown New York world, which at that point seemed very far away from Fish and the Grateful Dead and Widespread Panic. I, I think it comes from that same exact ethos. Like, again, it, it can feel small, but I think the underlying ethos of experimentation, of trying new things, of collaboration, you know, of, of, of trying to innovate. Like when you look at, you know, one, one of the fun experiences we got to have kind of from a business perspective <laughs> is get close to both the Fish and Radiohead camps. And when you look at them, like musically, obviously, a lot of people think they're probably pretty far apart in some regards. Um, but from a business ethos standpoint, like both of those organizations have always challenged themselves in their own ways to be really innovative and progressive. And so, you know, it, it, it's, it's, that's how we want to be, right? We want to sort of respect the, the you know, uh, foundations of everything that we're doing 
just in the same way a band would, right? A band wants to explore new territory. You can't just get up there and keep doing the same thing unless you're the Grateful Dead, probably. But <laughs> <laughs> other than that, uh, you know, e even them, right? Look at all the business innovations they made. Look at how they always push the boundaries. I, I think as a business person and a, a, a people who love art and culture, like that's how you have to challenge yourself every day is what can be next and new and obviously taking care of your core, taking care of the audiences and the business that you have, but pushing yourself to, to always look at new territory and new things. It's interesting you mentioned you know, Fish and Radiohead, who I feel like um, were doing very, very similar things in, in very different scenes at around the same time in the late 90s and early 2000s. And you know, both of those bands really create a sense of place with their shows. And you guys have actually, you mentioned working a lot with Fish's production crew, but you have also worked with Radiohead's production crew, you know, Andy doing lighting up the tower and whatnot. So, I guess the ethos they've kind of created around the music and the band themselves has really guided your events as well. So. Okay. Hey guys, I'm a Tulane grad myself and I wanted to know um, what experience in New Orleans or place inspired you to really go this direction? Uh, I would bring it back to Tipitina's. Uh, I, when I was in school, that was kind of like the place. And I just remember having these transcendent moments of just like being so like in the groove and it was like there was no air conditioning. And then in between sets, you were hanging out at the neutral ground. And it just like, I don't know, I felt like really present. And um, that felt like something I wanted to be around and do more of. Yeah, I'd, I'd also uh, throw in there Vaughn's. Um, we still, that was like one of our uh, every week things. We would go Thursday nights to Vaughn's, see Kermit Ruffins, and it was just so New Orleans and had such a vibe and such a feel that I remember just having seen nothing like it in my life, and that was really powerful and wanting to then create something that had that same kind of powerful feeling. Well, I'll add just one other, and we kind of pay homage to it at Bonnaroo with Snake and Jake's. Um, it was a bar that I was working at in college that we uh, used their storeroom as our first office. And, um, you know, the, the first off, the duality of the two people that owned it at the time, you know, this guy Dave <laughs> Clements, who's this super generous, laid-back guy, and Tony Toko, who was a, a little bit more of an aggressive party guy. And so we got to witness, like, these two different people running a business together and dealing with, you know, a, a pretty wild, crazy scene there. But at the same time, you know, r really, like, you know, treating their staff and their, um, you know, patrons like they would want to be treated. It was, it was all about that. It was all about creating a, a, a sense of place that you could come to and feel like you were like almost home. And, you know, we, we still kind of get to, you know, do that on a regular basis of, 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 of look at that ethos of how you treat people in that environment, create this, this sort of thing that you can feel like is your own. I think a lot of people felt that way about that place. They felt that way about, you know, places like Tipitina's and, um, you know, it, it was an amazing place. New Orleans, we were so fortunate to be able to learn and grow there, both as a business and as people and people who respect culture because it's, it's such the wellspring of so many things that we're all passionate about. So, it, you know, it was really, really just awesome, you know, to, to have those experiences. And, yeah. Is that it for questions? All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you. We'll see you guys next year at the uh, third annual conference. Enjoy happy hour and the music this evening. Thank you, guys.